This is a remake of a previous RBD fracturing tutorial with newer features that side effects has added into Houdini since Houdini 17 and greater. If you are familiar with the newer RBD soft tools, you may want to skip this video and move on to the next one about manually creating constraints combined with the newer RBD soft tools workflow, which is also a remake of another previous RBD tutorial. Houdini has released a new set of RBD SOP tools since my previous RBD videos, and since I'm starting a new RBD mini series, this would have been a perfect time in creating a more updated video on the newer RBD SOP tools in Houdini. Basic concept number two, RBD fracturing. Let's start by dropping down a geometry node. Uh, let's drop down a box. Okay, I'm gonna fracture this box with the newer RBD SOP tools in Houdini. Hit tab, type RBD, it'll list down the newer RBD SOP tools in comparison to the good old fashioned .NET way. So these tools are extremely helpful and it makes RBD simulations a lot easier. So the one we're gonna use for fracturing is the RBD material fracture, just to demonstrate what it does. Fracturing has never been easier with this guy. This node does take a while to load when more pieces are being fractured, so use this node with caution. Later on, I'll show you how you can use the Voronoi Fracture node for designing and fast iterations. Now, how can we actually view the fracturing? In the good old fashioned way, we always had that loaded view node. So exploded view, that's how we used to do it. And this still works. I mean, you can hook this up to the first, first output which is outputting the geometry, the fractured geometry. And this still works. However, there is a newer tool that we can use. We can't see the constraints or anything like that. Best thing about this RBT material fracture is that it will create the constraints for us. So if you look over here, there's a constraints tab. The default settings automatically sets up the glue constraints for us. So this box, when you plug it into the RBD material fracture node, it automatically creates ready to use fractured cube that you can throw around in your scene and blow it up. It's very easy. However, when things get easy, so let me show you the other RBD exploded view. So exploded view, this is the newer uh, sort of visualization or debugging tool specifically designed for the RBD SOP tools. This node should not be in your chain of RBD simulation. For example, we still need to hook in an RBD bullet solver down here, and it's going to have to be chained together with everything else. This RBD exploded view node cannot be part of the chain. And what does that mean? Well, it means that we have to move this guy. Well, it's labeled black. I colored all my visual nodes black. So this is only for visual purposes. It's not part of the simulation. It's not part of the scene. This needs to be moved aside and we need to hook it up like this. So there's a lot of stuff that goes along in between here, but in general, you would hook it up. The bullet solver hooks up with a chain of nodes, RBD, other RBD soft tools in the middle here, and it would be chained up like this. You only hook this up like wherever you want to start debugging and visualizing each step. So that's what this node is for. So let's get rid of all this. This exploded view, if you come over here and enable the show constraints, this will show you the constraints that are already set up by default when you use the RBD material fracture, which is very, very handy. If you can see the, let me change the color of the background. Okay, and get rid of the grid. So you can see those white lines. Those white lines are the constraint lines. Let me see if I can change the color. Okay, if you click on RBD material fracture, come over to the constraints and the enable color. Let's enable that. Now we can change the color. Okay, I'm gonna change this to red. Okay, so we can clearly see the constraint lines. If we put the render flag on the RBD material fracture, we will not be able to see this, even if we go into wireframe. So I'm gonna switch this to wireframe so you don't see the red uh, constraint lines that we added in. However, you can take it out of these outputs. So let me just show you what it looks like over here. Now let me template RBD material fracture and I'll explain the outputs of this RBD material node in just a second. So this is viewing the constraints. So you can see that it's these red lines are right here. You can see the geometry only because I templated this node over here. If I turn this off, you won't see the original fractured box geometry. Now this will show you everything, the fractured box and the constraints because we have the render flag on the constraints. Now let's just 
quickly go over the outputs of this node. So I'm just going to delete all this. The fractured geometry, which is what we're seeing right here. So let me put the render flag on this guy and get out of wireframe. Hopefully you can see that it is a little faint. There are lines here. I guess it's more clear when you have this in wireframe mode. And let me turn off the template of this. Okay. So this is purely what we see for this fractured geometry, which is the first output. Let's take a look at the constraints. Now we've already seen this before. I showed you just a while ago. These are the constraints. This is the glue that's holding the pieces together. You actually have collisions. It won't fall apart as easily. There's something holding it together, which is the key to making your RBD destruction scenes more interesting. The last one is the proxy geometry, which will look almost identical to the fractured geometry. And that's because a low res version of our original fractured geometry. And since this is a very low poly, um, as far as like as low as it can get. So the proxy is identical to the fractured geometry. If we have something more complex, like each blast piece probably has like 20, a, a thousand points on each piece that's when the proxy geometry will come in handy because it will make a low poly count of each piece and have an approximate shape of each piece in order to make the simulation a lot faster and performance wise proxy is the key in getting performance in your rbd simulations now let's do a bit of a comparison though Let's try and use that same box. And I'm going to fracture this using a Voronoi fracture, the good old fashioned way. So let me turn this back. Let's drop down a Voronoi fracture. Now let's hook this up. Voronoi fracture needs a set of guide points to tell Houdini where do you prefer the fracturing to occur, to fracture it. So let me scatter some points, drop down a scatter node. And I'm going to hook in the box because that's where I want to scatter because that's the I'm trying to fracture the box. So you can see points are laid all over the outline of the surface of the box. So if we go in closer. There's nothing in the middle. So let's hook this scatter points, which were are the sample points for the Voronoi fracture. So the Voronoi fracture can do its job. Now let me template the Voronoi fracture while putting the render flag on the scatter every single blast piece okay this is hard to see so i'm going to lower the number of scatter points by like 10 so we can have a better look so each blast piece you'll see in the center this is the scatter points or the sample points it, it's guiding the Voronoi fracture telling it where to fracture i want a piece right here i want a piece blast piece right here so that's where this guide point is it's telling the Warner fracturing, I want you to fracture something here. So wherever you see a point, you see a fractured piece. I'm going to show you how this comes in handy. We can actually control the fracturing. Let's go back. This RBD material fracture has a similar feature. Fourth input of the RBD material fracture saying extra Voronoi points. So this is the same sample points system as to the Voronoi fracture. So we can do the same thing. We can drop down scatter node and hook the box here. Let's lower down the number. Let's do 10. And then let's connect this to the RBD material fracture. Put the render flag on the... Now there's something you need to know about this one though. This tab, primary fracture tab here, you'll see that there's a step one and step two. Well, there's two steps of fracturing happening over here. It's doing a fracturing on top of a fracturing. So it's fracturing it the first time and it's taking each piece and fracturing it again for more a higher level of detail and variety. Now we're just going to take the second one out and we're just going to look at what the first step does. Now you can see here this parameter is grayed out. So it's actually not using the scatter node that we've inputted into the, the fourth input. So let's enable this. Now, if you click this little arrow here, you can actually see the sample points that we fed into the fourth input. And you can highlight whatever you want to be affecting this RBD material fracture. I'm going to sidetrack for a few minutes to explain how we can manipulate the scatter points and control how things are fractured. Then I'll jump back to the RBD material fracture and continue on with the Voronoi fracturing as well. I'm going to create a different type of density and have these points focused on the top and the bottom and the middle to have i want larger pieces to be fractured and i want smaller more fracture to happen on the top and bottom and the middle of the cube will be less dense for we should have larger fractured pieces first of all i want to stretch this out first 
Let's stretch this up. I want this to be a little larger. Now we have scattered points, but this only creates points on the outside surface. I want points in the inside as well. I want to fracture the entire cube. I want uh, fractured pieces in, even in the middle of the cube or it's not a cube now it's a stretched cube in order to manipulate the density of the guide points i'm going to use a vdb from polygon first of all let me drop down the voronoi fracture and have this all set up first so there goes my geometry there goes my guide points and the reason why i want scatter points in the middle of the polygon is i'll show you by doing a clip on this now this is only for visual purposes because I want to demonstrate and I turn this around. You can see that these points or, or these fractured pieces are actually an entire hole. I guess it's, it's still hard to see, but each piece is going all the way into the middle. Let me get rid of this. I'm going to take one of these pieces out and I'm going to pull it up. Okay, this piece goes all the way through. Well, not all the way through. It goes into the middle because we have another scatter point on the surface on the other side. Select another piece, this one, and I'll pull that one out. Okay, that got an adjacent piece. But okay, if I pull this one out, we will get to the other side very quickly. Okay, these adjacent pieces are getting in the way. But what I want to show you is that these pieces are going all the way into the middle. By selecting these guys, I'm actually going to the other side. And that's not what I want. I want smaller fracture pieces happening even in the middle of the geometry. I will need to scatter points into the middle and not only on the surface of the polygon. And to help us, we need volumes. So first of all, let's drop down a VDB from polygons to turn the box into a volume. But it's not enough to turn it into any volume. What I need is a fog VDB. Now, in order to manipulate the density of the volume, I use a volume fob to manipulate the volume density and translate that density into the scatter points. You can see that the volume is being changed here inside the volume box. All I'm doing is taking the density and I'm sampling it, and then I'm multiplying it with the position. I'm using the Y position of each voxel to define the density. The higher the Y, the density increases. And to deal with the negative Y, I use the absolute node so all the negative Y values become positive. And as the Y position drops below zero, the density also increases. This will get us the top and bottom fracturing that I want on my polygon. Then I fit this back into a zero to one um, range that I can manipulate. The source in the min is promoted so I can change it at the top. Now this is a little beyond the scope of this tutorial, but I want to show you how you can manipulate the scatter points using volumes. This is what I resulted in. And that's because my box is not really under the y-axis that much. So let's take a look. Let's pull this down. Okay, there you go. That's when I start to get more scatter points on the top and bottom. So that it's more dense on the top and the bottom part of the mesh of the polygon. So let's see what happens to the Vornor fracture. In theory, we should have larger fracture pieces in the middle and more smaller fracture pieces on the top and bottom. And we should also have fractured pieces inside of the polygon because now we have guide points inside the polygon telling Houdini, I want to fracture the interior as well. So let's take a look at the Vornor fracture. Let's see what we have. Okay, we still can't tell much from here. So let's drop down an exploded view get rid of my template and if you look at this we do have larger pieces in the middle over here and, and it does get smaller and smaller fractures on the top and bottom now in order to be sure to make this a little bit more fancy now i'm just going to paste this in now this note here is simply just measuring the surface area of each blast piece and that just gets recorded into an area attribute here in this geometry spreadsheet. Promote that in order to find the maximum, like the highest area. So I can make this a little, the color ramp a little more procedural. So you can see here, this is an expression and really it's just getting the max area. That just allows me to procedurally get the highest area. So it would always map from red to yellow to green. Like this would always, it would always cover this. The largest surface area would always be green. So this is just a neat 
trick to make this a little bit more procedural. And this just gives us a color visualization of what's going on. So the green pieces and green and yellow are the larger blast pieces and the ones going towards red and orange are the smaller ones. In the next video, I'm going to continue right where we left off. I'll manually create our BD constraints from scratch and feed it into the bullet solver. As we go through, I'll point out the differences between the newer RBD stop workflow and the older Boronor fracturing workflow and how we can also combine both together. Thanks for watching and sticking to the end.